Welcome to the Doc Talks podcast, a conversation on what's new and relevant in the world of Canadian medicine and hospital healthcare. I'm your host, Ian Gillespie, and I'm here to ask the questions and find the answers you need to know. We want to help our listeners know how to prevent and detect illness and how to navigate our healthcare system. Be sure to subscribe to the Doc Talks podcast to stay up to date on new episodes and follow us on Twitter at St. Joseph's London or visit sjhc.london.on.ca slash podcast. Hello, I'm Ian Gillespie. Welcome to the Doc Talks podcast, brought to you by St. Joseph's Healthcare London. Some of us likely remember a time when booking a yearly checkup with our family doctor was just part of trying to stay healthy. But is that common now? Has it changed? Is it something that people who don't have a family doctor, a number that's rising in Ontario, need to be concerned about? Today, we're going to try to find out some of those answers by talking with Dr. Laura Lyons, a family physician at St. Joseph's Family Medical and Dental Centre, where she provides comprehensive care to patients at every stage of life. Dr. Lyons is an associate professor at the Schulich School of Medicine and Dentistry at Western University, and in 2021, she was one of seven physicians in the province named Regional Family Physician of the Year by the Ontario College of Family Physicians. Dr. Lyons, thanks for joining us today. Hi, I'm happy to be here. So let's start with, this is something I don't think I was even aware of this, but as I said in the intro, we're all, a lot of us of a certain age are used to going to a family doctor, if we had a family doctor, if we have a family doctor, for an annual checkup, but that has changed. And tell me, correct me if I'm wrong, and maybe you can uh, expand on this, but that dates back to a sort of a policy change about 10, 11 years ago. Is that right? Yes, it is. And actually, the research and the suggestion for this change was as far back as 1979. But it really, as as you said, it has been an expectation in our society to have those yearly checkups. So it's taken a while for the message to really be shared with patients of changing the focus from that yearly checkup to um, more of a focus on wellness and health prevention. So I guess one of the questions is, does the average adult need a yearly checkup or is this only in certain cases and because when you reach a certain age, what are the sort of guidelines for those who should be getting a yearly checkup? So we kind of have a patient focused approach to this. So it depends on a number of things. And we do recommend that people have regular visits with their doctor to review preventative care guidelines. And so adults over the age of 50 don't need yearly checkups, but should be seeing their physicians every two to three years for some screening. But of course, there'll be those patients that have personal histories or family histories that put them at higher risk of either cancers, chronic disease. Also, we can't forget the importance of screening and supporting people through mental health so that there are people in the population that will be seeing their doctors much more regularly on a more scheduled basis. And then those that, especially in those years, um, those young years of teenagers and young adults and adults up to 40, for a general rule, those patients probably will only see their doctors when they have specific concerns that they want addressed. Right. Our doctors, they're not forbidden from doing an annual checkup. Are they? No, not at all. And I do have some patients that it's very important for them to have that annual checkup and and they continue to come despite that they're knowing that the annual checkup no longer has been, according to the evidence, associated with decreased morbidity, which is illness, or decreased mortality, which is death. So Hmm. that's the reason for the shift is that we found that the annual checkup, which is really that physical exam from head to toe, Mm-hmm. isn't what really makes the difference and that it's that counseling it's uh, looking at lifestyle it's ensuring that people are getting screened um, with blood work and getting supported around about their personal history and their family history that makes a difference right and I guess some of that would involve I, I suppose it's important to sort of develop a rapport with your family doctor right so that they are aware of your situation and what's new and what's what's bothering you and so on and so forth? 
Exactly. And that continuity of care with the primary care physician. And now we are fortunate we have some nurse practitioners that are running, you know, some health clinics. They're they're leading those health clinics. So we work with a team, but as primary care physicians, the continuity of care is really what I think makes us especially effective. It's the most rewarding part of our job because we do develop relationships with our patients and get to know them. And that enables us, I think, to provide a higher level of care, having that personalized approach. So having those check-ins with your family doctor is important so that you continue that relationship. And the other thing that's great is that because we are family focused and often take care of generations, so the grandparents, the adults, the children, the grandchildren, that often we might not see the young, healthy patients so frequently. But because we understand the family dynamics, that does enable us to continue that relationship with them despite not seeing them on an annual basis. It, it just prompts a question in my head for wondering, I mean, you said dimension sort of from cradle to grave. Is that sort of one of the elements of family doctoring that attracted you? Is that is that what pulled you into the field, possibly? Yes. I mean, for me, and I talk to my residents, because we train uh, residents at St. Joseph's Family Medical and Dental Center, that it really is a family medicine's a calling for many people because mm-hmm. of that ability to, to work in exactly that cradle to grave. So I deliver babies. And then I am privileged enough to palliate provide palliative care to my patients uh, in their end stage of life. So uh, that attracts a lot of people. It is, a, like I said, a calling for some that really get a lot of reward and enjoyment from that delivery of care. Not all family doctors practice to that scope, but many of them do. And we need to, I guess, touch on the shortage of, of family doctors. And one of the things, of course, we've heard about a lot is that young medical school graduates are what I've heard is they're often not attracted to family medicine. Is that the case still? Are we making some improvements there? Are we attracting more young doctors? So actually pre-pandemic, we had a really great numbers in terms of recruiting medical students to family medicine. And we actually had a surge. We had had a downturn and then we had a surge that came back, which was wonderful to see. Uh, The pandemic uh, has shifted that. So this Mm. last year, our recruitment was down significantly. And it's something that we take very seriously because we do know there's a shortage and we do want doctors to feel that family medicine is going to give them um, a balance of life. A lot of times the family physician lifestyle is what deters some young doctors. So uh, helping support them and supporting our whole profession to ensure that we can deliver good care and that bringing teams in and working collaboratively with our professional colleagues, it gives a more robust system that can deliver primary care to our communities. I guess we should ask this question is what sort of advice or what do people do who may be listening who don't have a family doctor or we're at that stage now where so I, I've experienced it myself where family doctors are often reaching the age of retirement and are, are leaving the, the workforce. What can you say to those who are without a family doctor or facing a, a future shortage or of, a, of their doctor? Mm -hmm. I get a lot of requests. I had one yesterday and um, it's almost daily where someone's saying, are you taking patients or do you know where I can find a family doctor? It is a concern. There is, for instance, in London, you go to the London Academy of Medicine. It's a website where they do list doctors that are accepting patients. The other source, like I said, is looking at Maybe not the traditional model of having a family physician, but looking at uh, community clinics and community health centers that do provide primary care with a number of professionals that work collaboratively. But unfortunately, there isn't enough uh, primary care right now for for everybody. And so we are relying a lot on walk-in clinics, but we are trying to expand through using our nurse practitioner colleagues and uh, our pharmacists are doing more now to help with treating uh, ailments that are straightforward that they can do and then they notify us family physicians uh, if someone has one. So we're, we're kind of bringing in a lot of different players. Paramedics are getting more involved in primary care. So, But we're also increasing our number of medical students uh, in our programs. So we are, I mean, the future is being planned to have more family doctors. But that's, that, of course, is down the road. Right. Okay. 
Earlier you talked about, in addition or to the yearly physical, that it's important to get screened for certain conditions or cancers or, I suppose, genetic conditions. So I guess, is that the onus is on the patient to sort of be aware of family history or how does that play out? Yeah. So usually if someone does have a family history, they will be the one to initiate the screening. If we're aware of it in our office, we're sitting with that patient in front of us, then then that will trigger us that um, this patient does need more screening and, and a different approach to their preventative health. But we screen for cervical cancer, and that's it done at 25. So letters are sent out by Cancer Care Ontario to people that need their cancer screening. The same goes for mammograms that that start at 50 years of age and colon cancer screening begins at 50. So there is a kind of a process to get people into that uh, screening stream. But if people do have a family history that requires additional uh, surveillance, then we kind of work jointly. Uh, and also, you know, I mean, some people, if a family member has identified to have a high genetic risk, then then often that's a notice to let other family members come in and, and get testing done. There is also an upper limit. So for POPs, it's 70. And for mammograms, it's 75. And for colon cancer screening, we get into concerns around doing colonoscopies when people are older because of the there's increased risks in the procedure. So then we look at that that picture and often uh, we will not do colonoscopies even beyond 75 or 80 at this point unless people are very high risk. Right. So is it important for certain patients to advocate for an appointment? Is that needed sometimes? Or, I mean, I suppose, I know my doctor has a huge roster and is very busy. Maybe there's a reluctance there to, to book in. Is, I mean, is, it, is, is that a skill? Is that something that people need to do? Well, that's a good question because often there is a wait time to see a family doctor. What happens in my practice and I think many practices is that we have some same day appointments. So if someone comes or calls in with a child with a fever, slot them in, um, you know, those things that need to be seen right away, they're slotted in. And then, then when people phone with a more general need to be seen, they may offer an appointment that's, you know, weeks out. So Yes, I guess it's important that the patients do communicate when they're booking an appointment what the urgency is for that because we need that clear communication because there will be some type of triaging of how long it takes to get an appointment, whether or not it's something that can wait a day or two days or a week or three weeks there is that that management piece. So good communication and advocation on your behalf is is important. I don't know if you can answer this question, but like, like what, how many <laughs> checkups would, would the average family doctor do in a day? Or is it, is it a lot? Is it your, your day is like half of the filled with physical checkups or is it like once or twice a day or once a week? Or? Now that's an interesting question as well. And I, I'm sure everybody has their own schedules. I, you know, I can only speak to kind of the scheduling system that we use and I know a number of different medical centers use. But we have what we call complex appointments, which would be longer appointments. They're used for preventative health counseling. If something is a complex medical issue, mental health counseling, they're used for well babies that require immunization. And often there's a lot of education uh, in those sessions as well. So those are complex spots. In my practice, I have three a day. Those sometimes get an extra one will get moved in, you know, as needed. But I would say that, you know, kind of those physical, um, more complex appointments, probably three to four a day would be typical. And then what would you say? I mean, I'm a guy. I, I don't know. This is maybe a stereotype. Men, I think, are sometimes more reluctant to go to a doctor. I mean, on the one hand, you said early that uh, the data indicated that uh, yearly annual checkups didn't really lessen morbidity substantially, I guess, right? But we still need to urge people to see a family doctor, right? So, I mean, what, what do you say to someone who thinks, ah, I'm fine, I got a few aches and pains, I, I went four or five years ago, I'm fine. Like, how do you counsel people who may be reluctant to go to a, a checkup? Well, I guess maybe education is a big piece around checking things like, uh, and it depends again, when you, you know, we're talking kind of aging and, and again, family history, but, you know, even 40, we got increased risk of hypertension, 
uh, high cholesterol, diabetes, mm. and, and those can be silent, right? You can have very few symptoms for that. So screening is an important part of maintaining your health. And there, there might be uh, no awareness that you have hypertension. And so, you know, to get that screened, to get some blood work to see what your cholesterol levels are, uh, is important because we do know treating both of those things are, are very significant in terms of decreasing the development of vascular disease. So I guess just educating, you might not know that you do have an underlying condition because not all of them have clinical symptoms. Right. And what about, I mean, the future? Are there any trends or developments or improvements that you see in the field of family medicine on the horizon? I mean, we've gone through this terrible phase with COVID. We read a lot about, of course, the, the stress factor of affecting physicians. But anything new and exciting, optimistic on the horizon about those who practice family medicine? I think there are. I think that, you know, as we bring in another generation of young doctors, I mean, they bring that knowledge of technology with them. And also some of our our older uh, family doctors really are quite astute with some technology and, and are big drivers in the field that way. And so uh, technology not only helps us communicate with hospitals and with other pharmacies, other medical providers, but it also is a way to communicate with patients. So interfaces so patients can email their doctors mm, um, yes. and get information and get results for tests, you know, that kind of direct line of communication those type of things are, are going to become more mainstream. Already, we've incorporated a lot more virtual appointments and there are virtual platforms that uh, when used appropriately are really valuable for patients in terms of their, they don't have to travel to a doctor. And, you know, with the virtual appointments, we've got the capacity for video as well as just a phone call. So those things are are definitely up and on the way and, and being moved in into our field. Uh, we were just talking this morning at a meeting around AI and how that's going to impact family medicine. And um, I really can't speak too much to that, but hope to find out more about that, you know, kind of in the, in the coming months as that becomes a hot topic of how it's going to impact how, how work is done. Um, but also, as I said, mentally, the um, idea of bringing in other professionals and working collaboratively as a team, that is going to really benefit patients as well and enable more resources to go out to patients and to meet patients where they're, not, they're at. I think family medicine is going to get out of the family medicine office a little bit and go oh. more to where people are because we know there are people that don't access primary care, uh, partly just because of barriers of transportation, of really just uh, the time of day, and uh, also mobility issues. So there's, mm. and, and really just personal comfort to go into a, a busy office. So I think mm. things are going to evolve where we're going to have to be a little bit more adaptable to meet patients where they're at. Oh, that's interesting. So, yeah, as far as looking to the future, more communication, more collaboration, as you were saying, but interesting, they're kind of a retro look in that uh, still the benefits of, I think I recall my family doctor coming to the house with a little black leather bag, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, so yeah. there's obviously something to be said for that sort of approach also. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And sometimes it might not be the house, but it might be a community center or it might be another type of area where people gather. Okay. Dr. Lyons, thanks very much. It's been fascinating and helpful to learn about all the things that we need to be aware of uh, when it comes to our personal health. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. That's it for this episode of the Doc Talks podcast. Thanks for joining us. And join us next time when we'll continue our conversation on what's new and relevant in the world of Canadian medicine and hospital healthcare. Be sure to subscribe and follow us on Facebook and Twitter at St. Joseph's London. Or visit sjhc.london.on.ca slash podcast. Until then, stay healthy. <laughs>